Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome, Group B, to Airdrie Baptist Church in the service this morning. It's been a long time since we've seen you in the building, and it's wonderful to have you back. I also want to give a very warm welcome to the church family at home, uh, and for those who are listening to the live stream, uh, we give you a warm welcome to, and also to Stuart. Stuart, welcome, and uh, a, a, nice to have you back with us this week. Stuart was with us last week, uh, and Stuart, what I would say to you is, to be back two weeks in a trot is quite impressive. My first time here was 2001, and they invited me back in 2020. So, well done in that respect. Um, if you were looking for Jason this morning and, and, and looking forward to seeing him, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but he is not here. Now, there's two things I'd like to say about that. Mum, now would be a good time to log into the live stream and start uh, generating all those likes that we talked about. And the other bit would be a good evangelist would bring out a gospel message about he is not here. He is risen. risen. Amen. Uh, in terms of, there's some notices for you, some instructions that I'll give, uh, and for the live stream back home, um, you'll probably be enjoying the service with your cups of tea and also your toast sitting on the sofa. Uh, you, Group B, will get to do that next week, and Group A, you'll be back in the church uh, next week with us, okay? In terms of notices, what we have for you, the Bible study is happening tonight at 6.30, so that's on the Zoom platform, and that's with uh, Terry Boyle, and he's taken us through Hebrews. It really, really is a great evening to be a part of. So on the church website, there are details there about how you can log in and be a part of that. We've also got the prayer meeting on Wednesday, and again, there are, uh, or there's information on the church website in relation to how you access that. Just talk to one of the deacons this morning if you need more information. Uh, a quick thing just about the live stream. I have never been so delighted to be asked to lead the service. And the reason is I was involved in the training for the AV this week, and it is the most complicated thing I have ever seen. So I just want to point out that Kyle's on the PC, Katie's on the camera, David's on the live stream, and my thanks to them for that but also for James for putting all of that together. It, we really do appreciate what's been done here. So this morning, in terms of you, Group B, you'll be back in two weeks' time, and these are the seats that you'll use for the foreseeable future. So try and remember those. At the end of the service, I'll give you some instructions about how we leave, so a bit about that. Uh, and I've also been told, this is a direct quote, you can't sing. That's a wee bit harsh. Uh, because, it, well, actually, I've heard some of you, but uh, no, that's a wee bit harsh, but what's happening is during the worship songs that are on, the folks at home will be singing at home, but for us, we'll be listening to the music and the worship that Christine's playing, but I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Uh, and again, another just piece of information, the offering baskets at the back as you're heading out, so you can use that from there. Okay, let's get ourselves ready for worship this morning and for meeting with God. Psalm 42, 2 says the following, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My question this morning would be, are you thirsty? Lord, make us thirsty for you. The psalmist also says, when can we go and meet with God? Well, the answer is, we can meet with him right now. And he's here, and we want to welcome him here with us. So I want to encourage you this morning, both here and at home, to look up, to focus on him, and let's get ready to meet with him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to meet with you this morning. We invite you here by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we'd ask that you would just envelop us just with your presence and your love and your joy and your goodness and your kindness. Father, draw near to us as we want to draw near to you and be blessed in our worship this morning. Amen. So the first song that we're going to sing this morning, well, the first song that the folks at home are going to sing is, I am weak but thou art strong and the words will come up. Christine will play that for us and we will rejoice in our hearts whereas those at home will sing for us. Okay, Christine.
Thank you, Christine. That was beautiful. Hey, the reading for this morning is First Peter, and we'll go through that in a few minutes. If you want to get that out, it's First Peter chapter 4, verses 3 to 19. But I'll read those out in a few minutes from now. Hey, typically, at this part in the service, we'd have a time of prayer. Uh, and so what I would do is I'd just encourage you to think about, take some time to think about those who absolutely need our prayers at this time, in terms of lo- those leading the nation, those within our own local authority in the town of Airdrie, those in need, uh, family members, friends. Let's just take the time to bring them before our God, because He is able. Let's take a few minutes just to bring these people before God. Father in heaven, we bring ourselves and our families before you. We thank you that you are the living God. You are the creator of the whole world, and everything is in your hands. There is nothing that surprises you. There is nothing that is a shock for you. There are things that grieve your heart, absolutely. But you know all things. Father, we ask that you would draw us back to you. Father, we ask that you would lead us through this time. Thank you for the incredible acts of grace and mercy that you have poured out upon us in this year. But Lord, we want to know your heart. We want to know that we're stepping out with you and in your direction. What a great and awesome God that you are. You are the mighty counselor. You bring comfort to our souls. And God, you love us to the core. Thank you that no one loves us like you do. Father, I ask that you would make us aware of the needs of others around about us, within our homes and families, within our streets, within this town of Airdrie. Father, I ask that you would cause us and make us to be the answer to the prayers that are going out in this town and in this nation, Father. Lord, catch my attention. Don't let people go by me who need your grace and need your touch. Father, I want to give you our local authority here and the local authorities in in Scotland. Father, I want to pray for the leadership that goes on there. I want to pray for our government. I want to pray for our schools and education, for social work, for services for businesses, for the self-employed, for those not employed, Father. We ask that you would be there all and all. We ask that you would give us everything and you would give them everything that they need. Come and surprise us today, Father, in each of these situations that we bring before you. You are the miracle-working God and we praise you and we worship you. And we say we would not want to be in anybody else's hands but yours, Father. And we take great confidence from that. Lord, speak into our hearts. I say again, cause us to be the answer to the prayers of those around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a reading from 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, 3 to 19. And Stuart will come and speak to us about that. I'm going to read from the... NIV. Uh, Now, bear with me because there's some hard things at the beginning of the passage, but there's some incredible words as you read through it. And the passage is entitled, Living for God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you but they will have to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason 
the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. And here we go. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And then it goes on into 12 to 19, and it's entitled Suffering for Being a Christian. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the Spirit of God Sorry, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Amen. Let's be blessed by God's word. The next worship song that's going to come up, we don't have the words for those, but it's going to be Spirit of the Living God that Christine is going to lead us through. And again, those of you who are on the live stream at home, sing out your hearts the loudest and best you possibly can. And for us here, we will rejoice in our hearts to God. Bear this next bit in mind, though, Zephaniah 3.17. For us sitting here, while we won't be singing out, this is what 3.17 says. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He takes great delight in you. Not just the group here, but the individuals. He takes great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. Here's the next bit. But rejoice over you with singing. As we sit and we listen to Christine playing, the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth, is singing over you. Christine.
Good morning, everyone, and good morning to the millions watching on YouTube. It's uh, really nice to be back again this week. It was such a pleasure. It was my first time in physical church in a, a long time as well. Uh, last week, my wife and my children were watching on YouTube, and the children were very excited. Daddy's on the television, so I said that I would say, hello, hello, children. How are you this morning? I'm about to tell the people here and who else is watching a little story about, about you and your artistic tendencies. Uh, so let me get on with that. Uh, lockdown, I imagine, has been a, an interesting time for everyone. Um, we uh, actually were very blessed in the sense that our children were home with us. And while there were days where you thought your head was actually going to explode and you were going to pull your nails off against the wall, uh, most of the time it was a real joy, especially thanks to God for the lovely weather that we had uh, for weeks. And we, we basically, I think everyone went to Argos and bought stuff to keep the kids happy. We tried our best to find a trampoline and could not find one. Everyone, now they're all being sold on Facebook Marketplace. Um, but one of the things that happened in lockdown is that uh, when you've got three kids, and we have a, a, young, a young boy now who's now crawling and eating everything under the sun, and uh, he's a joy, uh, a very happy wee boy, is that uh, you get a wee bit tired, especially if you're up late at night, uh, with your with your young child, uh, and then the other more energetic older children who are five and four, uh, kind of get away with a lot more than they normally would, uh, and they're great artists, um, <clears throat> and we love to see them be artistic, uh, just not on our walls, uh, and so our wall uh, in our hall is covered in uh, drawings, and uh, instead of uh, quickly painting over it, I just wrote on the wall, do not draw on the wall. <laughs> uh, and sad to say it's still there, there's two tins of paint still waiting uh, to cover up this messy hall wall. Um, the other thing we like in our house is carpets, especially our bedroom carpet, it's nice and cream uh, color. Uh, but now it has big lipstick stains, and, and if you're watching children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It now has these black cherry lipstick stains all over our bedroom carpet. Great artwork. Uh, we, we forgot to add, we wanted to get a picture. She'd actually covered in her entire face. So all you could see was her little white eyes and teeth smiling at us at the end of that. Now, why am I telling you that? Well, I have to say, my children might be saying, that's a bit much coming from dad. You know, he contributes to the mess in the house. And I do, with coffee, constantly. I'm a constant coffee spiller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially when you're carrying your, your kid around and you're doing everything one-handed. Uh, and the best ones, though, I have, and I hate to say I've done this more than once, is uh, falling asleep with coffee in my hand, in bed. You may be th judging me on my drinking coffee in bed, decaf, but I don't think that's the issue. Uh, I woke Lindsay, my wife, up a few weeks back, <laughs> covered in coffee. I had fallen asleep and went, whoop. Uh, now that leads me to, well, what do we do then? We have this big duvet that needs wash that's not fitting in the washing machine. So I go looking for a, a place like a, a dry cleaner, not a dry cleaner, what do you call them? One of the, the place that has washing machines. I can't, remember, can't believe I can't think of the name of that. Uh, and uh, um, I found one. And we, I took it to the, the place and we managed to get the whole duvet sparkling clean, completely clean and white. It was great. I was so relieved and it didn't cost that much. Um, but in the process of looking for somewhere, I found that there was another one nearby, and I thought, I'll check out the comments, because they didn't seem as established as the other place. Um, and somebody had complained about a rug that they had given to them to clean. And they complained and said it had more stains after you cleaned it than it did before it. You might think, well, I'd never take my rug there. But the person who works at the company says, we explained this to you at the time. If you have a rug that has years and years of stains in it, when we clean it, you will clean the top stains, but you'll be left with stains that will never be moved. Uh, and I, I really just was thinking, I like to do a sermon to just kind of have a wee story, something that relates, an illustration. And I think that that story actually illustrates quite well uh, some of the things that Peter is writing us to us about today. Uh, and by the way, our children are very sweet, just so you know. <laughs> they're not little terrors that terrorize the house and vandalize them. Um, but uh, they're very sweet, uh, and I hope they're enjoying seeing their dad again this morning. 
Now, uh, Paul's right, there's some heavy stuff in this passage, and we're not going to focus on that, especially some of the content could be a, a bit more for adults. Um, but I think there's some great things to be said from God this morning. And like I said last week and with every sermon, uh, the message that I give and the intent of the message that I give this morning uh, may not be what you receive. So I encourage you, and I always ask God to open the hearts and the, the minds of the people listening, what is God saying to you? Um, what is the message for you? Because I've often found that the one part of the scripture that I've not focused on is the one thing that encourages somebody. So, so I do pray uh, in your presence that God would help you to get past me and find God. So last week, um, we're kind of looking at reputation and, and giving the world an example of uh, that's different from what we see in the world, which is dog eat dog. Uh, and the last two verses we looked at last week were First Peter 4, 1 to 2, where Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So this was in contrast to the dog-eat-dog, -dog, eye for an eye world that we live in. This week, we are looking at what's the message for you here at Airdrie Baptist Church and what is the message for the church and for us as a community. But I, I believe that it's, it's time, looking at these two services and these two sermons together, to think about us personally. What is Peter saying to us personally? Because while we are the family of God and while we are all one in Christ, we are also individuals within the body of Christ. And the message isn't for, well, that's for Air Baptist to do, and for some people to say, well, that's good, Paul will do that, or somebody else will do that. It's for every single one of us. And if you've fallen, chosen to follow Jesus, whether you're here presently or watching, or watching later, then there is a good message in here for you. If you haven't chosen to follow Jesus, you're not a Christian, um, but you're curious even, uh, maybe skeptical but curious, then there's a message for you too. Um, now, what's the first point I think Peter's made? Before, you weren't that good. That's the message. Before Christ, you weren't that great. Uh, and for you spent enough time in the past choosing to do what pagans choose to do. And it's written slightly different in the New King James Version. I use the NIV as well. Um, but he says, uh, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Now, I think, I don't think we could say that we were all involved in these behaviors. Uh, I, I can't imagine that, uh, that all the people in here can say, yes, guilty of all these <laughs> sins. Uh, what, what an illustrative uh, and, and colorful church we would have if we would say that in our former life we were involved in all these kind of practices and behaviors. So I don't think many of us in here could say that, yes, we're guilty of all these things that Peter is saying. Um, maybe one or two of us could say, yes, we were guilty of one or two of them. And maybe some of us can say that we've never been involved in any of them. Even though I wasn't a Christian, I was actually quite clean cut. I never wanted to get involved in all that stuff. However, I don't think that's Peter's point. He's not saying, well, okay, if you've not been involved in these sinful behaviors, then this doesn't apply to you. Peter is giving examples, and some might say extreme examples, of your, of our former separation and difference from God before we encountered Jesus. Before you were apart from God. Before you were more likely to behave like this than you were like Christ. So before Christ you were not that great. And number two, you're done with that now. That old life's gone. It's past. Bye-bye. It's not you anymore. And many Christians like myself can look back and say, I don't remember that person. I don't recognize that person that I was. It's weird to think that it was me behaving that way. And that's, that's an amazing thing. So Peter's saying you've spent enough time away from God, so now it should be done, over, out of your system. In fact, it's out of you altogether. You're not that rug that's been cleaned only in the surface. 
You're the duvet that's been put in the machine, completely washed clean. The old self is gone. The stains are gone. You've been washed, cleansed, made right, set free. So really, every single one of us, no matter our age, should be done with it all by now. Besides, as it says in 412, you're, you're done with that, you know, because whoever suffers in the body has finished with sin. We're done. It's over. But the problem with it is, and especially I think of younger people, but I don't I think it's exclusively to them, but I think as younger people, and I think back to being a, I started to follow Jesus when I was 16, and my testimony actually, uh, I'd like to say that from 16 onwards I followed Christ. No, I, I fell at this point. Uh, experienced uh, mental health issues, uh, was a bit lost, uh, and, and like these Christians that Peter's writing to, we're seeing the behavior and lifestyles of peers uh, and belonging to a church that didn't have a thriving youth group or whatever, I feel that I want to be a part of it, and actually that's the age most difficult, I think, is youth groups are great up until that age when you're about 18, 19, 20, and you think, I'm kind of done. And I think the hardest time for Christians is that early 20s. It's actually the hardest time for a human being when it comes to mental health as well. It's when mental health begins. It's when most of it's diagnosed is in the early to mid 20s. And so this message I think is very helpful for young people who are university or leaving school or even in school and seeing the behavior and lifestyles and so-called happiness of their peers and think, oh, this is hard. I don't want to do this. This is really difficult being a Christian. Here I am being dragged along to this old building and this old church with older people. And it's not that you're being offensive, but that's just how you feel when you're younger. It's certainly how I felt when I was younger, especially going out to church on a Sunday evening with seven people, with my friends just a couple years older than me, and thinking, this is what I'm doing on a Sunday night, and my pals are all at home playing the Mega Drive, and what would be the Xbox One now. Um, Peter speaking to that. Say, so, well, if you're a Christian, you're done with that. Um, and he recognizes that it's difficult. It's very difficult to be a Christian when you're surrounded by a culture that mocks you for your beliefs and for your lifestyle choices. The abuse and the, the tempting and teasing of those friends and peers and communities that you belong to can quickly become actually the rejection of those peers and friends and communities. So you don't belong to them, you used to belong to them. So Peter recognizes that it's tough. There's a cost for living as Christ would have us live. And it's a serious cost. It's a hurtful cost. It's hard. I think of two young kids here and the young, young adults, young teenagers maybe in the church. It's, it's tough being a Christian. It's not a, an appealing thing for a lot of young people to be different. We want to be different, but and different in the punk sense, or different in the, the rap sense, like, oh, I'm different from everybody else, but I'm part of the different group, whereas being a Christian, you're just different. You don't fit into a cool mold, you know? Even Christian music and artists and all these things that we have, which is amazing now, um, are still not respected by the secular world. Peter recognizes that it's tough to be done with that way of life. But here's the encouragement. He's saying, look, they have not stopped you from doing it. You chose. God and you chose this. It's not something that's happened to you. You're not a victim. You've turned your back on an old way of life. You've turned your back on the life that the world offers, and you've chosen true life. And he's saying, you've been there, you've done that, there's nothing there. There's nothing of value. Nothing eternal can be offered to you from the world. Nothing. All the laughter and joy and parties and revelry and idolatry brings nothing. The reason people keep doing it is because the moment they stop drinking at the weekend, they're bored. They have to face life. People party for that very reason, to party, to escape. They're not 
bad people, but there's nothing of value. You have to keep doing it to get yourself through life. As Christians, we don't have to do it to get through life. We have been filled. We have what we need. But the problem is it upsets the apple cart. It rocks the boat and it causes discomfort. My wife and I are not sheltered. I was certainly more sheltered in the sense that I was <clears throat> raised a Christian and I would say I had a good value background. And Lindsay certainly did as well. But, uh, but it wasn't kind of like um, clean in my living all the way through it. And we both have had experience in the past of being part of drug culture and being around people that take drugs. Um, now, people, stoners, people who smoke cannabis, it's all great and fun and yeah, well, I'll just chill out, let's watch programs and, you know, the world would be better if everybody smoked pot. But see, the moment you stop smoking pot, ooh, you're the enemy. Because it messes with things. They don't want to sit around with you sober while they're all getting stoned. It rocks the boat. And some of these people may, I doubt they'll see this, but some of them will know me and go, what? I'm like, well, it's true. You've said it as such to me, to Lindsay. You don't like it when people stop behaving the same way as you. It's like anything, actually. You take whistleblowers on a company or a charity. People don't like them because it upsets things. In church, when you whistleblow, people don't like it. Just, shh, oh, no, don't, know. It's the pastor, or, or they've been here a long time, or, or they're just young. People don't like it when you say, this isn't right, and I'm not going to be a part of it. Even if you've not, even if you've said, you know, carry on, do what you want to do, but I'm not going to. Some people don't want to let you off with that either. And this is what Peter's talking about. I know these Christians are coming around and going to all these places and saying, you're all evil and you're all bad. They're not, they've just decided not to be involved anymore. And we're, we, I think, Peter, we can take from this, don't be surprised at this suffering. Don't be surprised at the attack you get from people. I think the issue is that it raises questions for them that they don't want to ask. Um, and, and I think if it's just... It's not laziness. Well, I mean, it's partly laziness, but I think it's just, look, life's tough, and this is my way through, and by you challenging it, you're taking away the thing that helped you through. I think a lot of the time that's the issue. But sometimes it can be really venomous, and people can turn on you because you're a Christian. And kids will experience it in schools, jibes and remarks and stuff. I don't believe as Christians we're called to talk about Christophobia, and to make ourselves victims. I mean, Jesus told us that, yes, we're going to get a hard time for this. I don't think we're meant to start banning around, you're Christophobic like everybody else. I don't personally believe that's what he's asked us to do because he's prophesied this is what's going to happen. We should certainly point out when people are treating us differently, absolutely. Um, I don't think we're meant to be, to be victims, but it's there. Christophobia is there. Young people will experience it in school. You might experience it in your workplace. Maybe not because people are careful what they say, but it's out there. Just watch any stand-up comedian to know uh, that Christianity is not respected. Listen to the laughs of the audience of the stand-up comedians, and you will know that sentiment and feeling towards Christians is, you know, they're not big fans of us, to be honest. Um, now, our culture may not be as debauched as the culture Peter's writing to, although I think it is, but, but anyway, let's, I think that just the difference is that back then, this was what everybody did. Uh, whereas, uh, and uh, I think today we can address it up differently. I mean, the 60s was incredibly a moral period of time. I mean, part of the reason we're dealing with some of this stuff today is because of the 60s. And people for the 60s go, why are kids the way they are today? Well, the 60s, <laughs> a big part of it. The 50s before that, you know? Uh, I mean, I, I, I used to hear stories about a grandmother complaining about Elvis, you know? And Oh, that'll bring in all sorts of stuff. And everyone thought she was crazy. And they're crazy to think that. But look at it now. And now we're crazy to think that this is debauched. And this shouldn't be talked about every single time. But, but it's always dressed up as just a bit of fun. You know, or we'll dress it up as like free love. 
was the 60s. It's free love, you know, just loving everybody. It's not immorality, it's being free and loving and shedding uh, the kind of old school judgmental stuff. It's, it's free love. And in the 70s and 80s with punk, it was, uh, oh, our immorality uh, and stuff is actually uh, railing against corporatism and capitalism and, and uh, institutional religion that keeps everybody down. You know, we're rebelling. Uh, so we'll dress up our immorality as, as something good. Uh, same thing happened in the 80s and 90s with rave culture. Uh, and I think even now with a lot of the leftist movements that we see and some of the right-wing movements, that there's not much difference between them. There's immorality in both the left and the right, but they're dressing it up as, but we're the right ones so we can do what we want. In fact, John Cleese has an amazing video, if you can find it on YouTube, or maybe should have given you a link, where it's a, a little parody about talking about how you can do what you want uh, if you're in the right. You can cancel people and do whatever you want if you're in the right. And so why do I talk about that? Well, I think it feeds into our culture. I think it feeds into what Peter's saying here. I mean, the point is that as humans, we like to dress up our sin as something more palatable. We say it's natural or, or feelings are paramount. So truth and reason are thrown out and we are left in the state that we're in now. And for all our advances in the human race, it seems that immorality has not advanced one jot. You see, we have a more moral world than we, ha than we did 100 years ago? I don't think so. There's peaks and troughs. There are countries that do better with morality in some areas than others. So it's not surprising that if the world's morality hasn't changed in all these thousands of years, that when someone chooses to step outside the morality of the world, that they're going to get jipped for it. So I think the encouragement is not so much that he's saying, you're, is, is that he's saying you're going to get a hard time for this. That's the encouragement. It's another one of those examples of God saying, I knew this was going to happen. That encourages me. It's, it's not something that surprised God. It's not something that God's saying, well, that shouldn't happen to you. It's saying, well, that's what does happen when you follow Jesus. Now, here's a couple of things that I think we need to bear in mind before uh, we carry on with this message. Be before you get tempted to thinking that you're better than those who aren't Christian, better than those who don't live in sin, there are two things to be aware of. One, thinking you're safe. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul writes, uh, be careful. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall yourself. And the second thing to be careful of is thinking that you're better. In Romans 12, 3, Paul says, and this is more for us as each other within the church, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And Jesus um, gives a great parable about two men who went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. What a great guy. But the tax collector stood at a distance, didn't go up, right up to the temple. He would not even look up to heaven but he beat his breasts and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So amongst the stoners, amongst the sinners, amongst the people in those cultures that we may be tempted to judge and say, yeah, they must all be really far from God. There are some in there who will be in heaven because they will at one point get to a point where they will cry out to God and recognize their need, and there'll be people in the churches that we think have it all together who will not be there. That's a very serious warning. Because no matter how much we clean our rug, there could still be stains there, because we may have just done the superficial. And we think, oh, every Christian we meet that says a Christian, oh, they're all, they're all Christians, they're all, uh, they're all close to God. Mm-mm. I'm, I've been a Christian for a long time, and I haven't always been close to God, but people might have made the assumption that I was. 
And when I was a mess, some people would think, oh, these, you know, he couldn't possibly be a Christian. But then there have been times where I've ministered in dark situations with people that, you know, the church would never get a chance to even have a conversation with because they're not there. So I think the, that's a very important point that Jesus is making. It's not about what you do and how you look and who you hang out with. It's about you and God and your relationship and your humility before Him. So be careful not to judge that you are better than them. And if that is your attitude, then you're missing what Jesus has done for you and why He did it and why He did it for you. But you're also missing the price, the price that these people will pay as a consequence of their rejection of their loving Creator God. We should be moved to tears as Jesus wept over Jerusalem that these sinners who mock us and jeer us will pay for that. And it's not that God's going to say, I'm going to strike you down, but the natural consequence of the rejection of God is no God. And if there's no God, there's no eternal life in heaven. Sorry, I'm forgetting there's a camera there. I'm getting all walking about. Um, Always have to remember, because sometimes we're tempted to go, oh, they're just so nasty. But God knows that. God can see what they're saying about you. God can see what they're doing. And there's a natural consequence for rejecting God and attacking God's people. And so if we know that God's got that in control, then that should motivate us all the more to love them, to be kind and generous and gracious, to smile at them, to not repay evil with evil, as he was telling us last week, but with mercy and grace and blessing. So when the teenagers at school are mocking us, we don't respond in the same way. When in a workplace and people are making little remarks, we don't make remarks back. The very reason the gospel was preached was so that those who are dead, these people, and who we were, might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. When we see a culture that is in sin, it's a reminder of why God came. Why are we shocked? This is why Jesus came. Oh, I can't believe this. This is terrible. Yeah, of course it is. It's why Jesus came. The gospel was preached to let people go beyond the judgment and morality of this world so that we could live by the Spirit. And Peter gives us a how to be and why. He says, therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So protect yourself by being alert. Be smart. Be alert. And be sober-minded. It's not just don't be drunk on alcohol. It's sober-minded, thinking straight. Now, drinking drugs will undo that. They're a very obvious thing that would undo your being alert and and being sober-minded. But there are many other intoxicating consumables, and that includes thought processes, the way you think about things, beliefs, desires, grudges, ideologies, philosophies, sport, intellectualism, debate, emotions, hate, resentment, narcissism. These are all intoxicating. They will all intoxicate you to the point that you're no longer alert, that all you're doing is focusing on this, 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 and you're forgetting what God's really called us to, what God's saying to you. And if you're intoxicated with these things that are not the gospel, that are not God, then they will scupper your prayer life because you'll spend your most time doing that. And if you're spending most time doing that, it'll make it harder for you to be alert and sober-minded, which makes it harder to pray, which makes it harder to be alert and sober-minded, and so on and so forth. Today, make it stop. Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your energy and your thoughts on things that are not Christ, that are not God, that don't lead you and point you to God because they are attacking and weakening your resolve when it comes to Christ and your relationship with Him. And I am preaching to myself. I am playing Call of Duty far too much. (laughs) I am wasting time playing a computer game. You know, it's like, you can do these things, but too much. You're spending more time thinking about things that don't really matter. 
It won't make it very easy when it comes up, when you come up against people who want to bring you down for your faith. Be alert and sober-minded. And he goes on to say we should be using whatever gift we have received to serve others. Be hospitable without grumbling. So to him be the glory for, and power forever and ever, he says, amen. And so I finish with encouraging you to be brave in the face of the ridicule and the temptation to be like the world around you. Because Peter says you shouldn't be surprised at this. He said, all right, don't be surprised. You know, he actually says, it's almost like actually Peter saying, don't be surprised at this fiery ordeal that has come on, come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. It's a natural consequence of being a Christian is that you ruffle feathers and become someone that upsets the apple cart, even when you're not trying to. It may not be quite the same, and some would even caution me in saying, uh, saying this, that it is not far off. We're already there. Are, we're already at a point where there are significant groups in our society who would happily eradicate Christianity. I mean, if you've ever read uh, uh, The God Delusion, I mean, there, there's a manifesto for eradicating Christianity from every aspect of human life. And Richard Dawkins has given Ricky Gervais, like, an award, I'm like, for reason. I mean, it's, it's a joke. I mean, with all respect to love to Richard Dawkins, but he completely lacks reason and sense and fact when it comes to Christianity. He's completely ignorant, willfully ignorant. And Ricky Gervais, the same. They're smart, clever people, but when it comes to Christianity, completely unreasonable, completely unwilling to listen to reason and fact, but to spill out filth and lies about Christians as though we're the worst thing that could ever happen, us and Muslims and any religious person. We're already at a place where that book sold millions of copies. It made converts to new atheism. There is an appetite out there to eradicate Christianity and Christian values because we're so evil and nasty. They say that they, they, they overblow the influence that we have in this country. I mean, people say, oh, Christians have too much influence in this country. I'm like, where? Songs of praise? Where's Christianity represented positively on television in the UK? I don't see it. They say we've got too much power. Well, show me all the Christian uh, leaders you know, that are openly Christian and attend the church, show me them all. But they don't produce the evidence. It doesn't matter. There doesn't need evidence. We are hated and seen as mindless automaton morons. And thankfully, not everyone feels that way. That's not what I'm saying. Not everyone does. I'm so glad of that. I've got friends who are respectful and like, okay, I get it. I understand where you're coming from. But all you have to do is, like I say, watch the stand-up routines and you'll see Christianity and Christians made fun of constantly and stand-up routines, all the big ones, and Michael McIntyre Roadshow, it would come up. You'd see it. It's, it's not, not all of them. I'm not want to overstate. But the laughter, and the yeah, and the claps at the expense of someone just for following Jesus. And that's okay, you know, apparently. But the other thing that I think is most shocking is I've seen uh, adverts for two Christian charities on Facebook wanting money for Christians in other parts of the world who are, are persecuted. And the comments are unbelievable. Why should we help them? Look at this Christian charity. Why are they only helping Christians? Blah, 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 blah. You just wouldn't see it. And I actually, I probably shouldn't do it, but one of the person made a comment. I checked their Facebook page. And they were into animal charities. <laughs> and we should be. But my goodness, people starving and being persecuted by their own government. Let's criticize a charity that does that, but let's save a tiger. There's no appetite, there's very little appetite to preserve Christianity and Christians. But rejoice, because all this suffering and rejection and trial that we might experience, I mean, just think of it, I've, 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 watched, I, I've supported a football team, and I say support, I like the team, right? Uh, and I, I've watched them, I'm not going to say who they are, but you'll know who they are. I've seen them be like a total, like, woo, winning everything to being chucked in the bottom and then suffering through three or four leagues to get back to the top. And the, the excitement and joy of seeing them getting back to the top was amazing. But I had to go through all that uh, watching them do really badly to get back to the top. I wouldn't have appreciated getting back to the top if I hadn't watched them go from the bottom up. 
the joy that we will experience will be beyond words, beyond anything we've experienced when we, when we finally get to be with Jesus at the end. And so to the young people in the church, to the older people in the church, to those in the middle, never forget that there is heaven. This is what we're in it for. Eternal life, freedom from pain, freedom from suffering, freedom from COVID and the government responses, freedom from lies, freedom from deception, freedom from all the drinking and partying that young people like to get involved in and make you feel like you're missing out. You're missing out on nothing, and I'm looking right at the young people. What other people have in this world and say, Christians, blah, 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 blah. Christianity is real, it's valuable, and Jesus will help you through everything in life. The world cannot offer you anything close to what Jesus offers. And I wish that I'd followed Jesus younger than 16. I wish that I'd never wandered away. Following Jesus is, there's nothing else. There's nothing else. You get washed, you get cleansed, you get to start again. You get to be in a church with people who love you, who will treat you differently from the way the world will, who will treat you with love and compassion. What a vision for church to be sober-minded, alert, eager to see each other experience and receive the gifts that we've been given by God, loving each other, not covering up each other's sins, but having the grace to forgive and sort things out, offering hospitality to one another, willingly, happily, dutifully, each using the gift we have been given for the benefit of each other, with God getting all the glory. What a vision for church. It sounds like the world should be like that, but it never will be like that. John Lennon's Imagine is the emptiest, most depressing song I've ever heard written. Imagine a world that had no God and no heaven and no hell and all these things. It is the most bleak, depressing sounding song I've ever heard in my life. And I was a big John Lennon and Beatles fan. But what an empty vision for the world. No God. Because what John Lennon is saying, imagine a world was full of love and all that. You can't have it without God. Humans have tried for centuries with movements to try and create something truly loving. You cannot have it without God. And what a vision for the future. All this will be worth it. Healing, glory, peace, things that you may currently feel is not likely or possible will be. You are out with the old and in with the new. And Jesus invites you this morning to accept Him, maybe again. Believe Him, believe in Him, trust Him. He invites you to ask your Creator God to father you, to forgive you and to welcome you into his family. He invites you to admit your need for God, to admit his rightness and your wrongness. And he invites you to do this knowing the cost for you in this world, but the reward that there will be for you in the next. And so let me just clarify that I love, love the people that are not Christians that I know, love them. Sometimes they are kinder to me and there for me more than some of the Christians I know. It's not about comparing, but love these people. They have families, they have lives, they have feelings, they have emotions. They're not just sinners. God didn't just see you as a sinner. Don't see them as just a sinner. See them as a future brother or sister in Christ. And be encouraged that God knows the suffering you're going through and that He is always always with you. Amen. We're now going to sing, we're not going to sing at home, uh, but we're now going to listen and read the words of Beneath the Cross of Jesus, and then we'll close in prayer.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for your message to us this morning. I pray, Lord, that, that what you said through me will be kept and will, will grow, will be a seed or will be water to seeds that are growing in each one of us. I pray, Lord, that it would stick with us and that you would help us to be obedient to what you say. I pray that you would remove anything that uh, was said that is a challenge, is a, an unhelpful challenge, and that only the good, pure word that you spoke would be, would be kept. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is your shepherd. You lack nothing. He makes you lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside quiet waters. He refreshes your soul. He guides you along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though you walk through the darkest valley, you will fear no evil, for he is with you. Your rod, his rod and his staff will comfort you. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil and your cup overflows. Surely his goodness and his love will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. That's the service over. Uh, what I want to do is just remind Group A to join us again uh, next week. You're going to be here. And what I would say to you is be encouraged, be lifted, be blessed this week because he is able. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate just your... Uh,